<clears throat> Another question you may be asked is if you're given a particular space, and let's say we're given it in the form where we know that it's in R3, but we have one condition on it, that is x plus y minus z equals zero. Okay, so this is a plane because it's only one constraint on R3. So if you have one equation in R3, it's going to be a plane when it's linear like this. Okay, so our goal is to find the orthogonal complement to that set. Where are all of the vectors that are orthogonal to this plane? Okay, so we're going to walk through the formal process. Now, there's actually a quick and easy way to get there if you go back and remember that the normal vector to this plane is, in fact, a uh, basis, or I guess the, the normal vector, we, we can identify the normal vector immediately from this and have um, then the set of all scalar multiples of that normal vector would actually be the orthogonal complement. So there's a shortcut in this example, but I need you to be able to see a general approach so when you're given a condition on W, how do you find what the orthogonal complement would be in general? So what I'm going to do is this way. I'm going to take this and say, okay, um, let's write the general form of this vector in this space by using the fact that this constraint tells me that Z is equal to X uh, plus Y just by moving the Z to the other side. So every vector in W has the form X, Y, X plus Y. In other words, it is 1, 0, 1 times x plus 0, 1, 1 times y. In other words, this w right here is in fact the span of 1, 0, 1 and 0, 1, 1. Okay? So knowing these vectors right here is actually a very key step because what I can do then to find the orthogonal complement of w is to realize that this right here if I put those columns into a matrix, they would form a matrix whose column space is this W. Okay, so if A is 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, then W is the column space of A. So I can go from basis vectors to column space by just putting those vectors in the column of A. And now W complement from theorem 5.10 is simply the null space of A transpose. So I can find it by simply taking this matrix, turning it on its side. A transpose is 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1. Which, by the way, in this case, we got lucky. This is already in reduced row echelon form. Okay. Now, if it wasn't, I would go through and reduce it, and then I'd be able to write my basis for the null space. Notice here I would let x3 equal t, which means x1 is negative t, and x2 is negative t, just by moving these to the other side. So I end up with t times negative 1, negative 1, 1. It was negative t, negative t, t, factor out the t. So W herp, or the null space of A transpose, is the span of negative 1, negative 1, 1. And again, what I was saying earlier, and I'll go ahead and make this point again, just so that you have it. Uh, this equation right here, the normal vector to the plane would be 1, 1, negative 1. So we could also immediately see that W perp is the span of negative, uh, or I should say 1, 1, negative 1. And you may think, okay, well that's not the same as this, but in fact it is. The span of this vector is the same as the span of this vector because this is parallel to that. This one is just negative of this one. So they're essentially in the same direction. Not essentially, they are in the same direction. And so the set of all 
scalar multiples of this is the same as the set of all scalar multiples of this. But this is the way to go from a set of vectors to find its um, orthogonal complement by just you making you put them in the columns of A and then find the null space of A transpose. At this point, I want to now move on to the second part of this, which is related, but it is uh, goes back to something we talked about back in uh, chapter one, which was projecting a vector onto a line or onto another vector. We're now going to take and project vectors onto general subspaces. You can think of it as a more general question of, well, recall. We'll just go ahead and write this out. In R2, if we had this vector u and this vector v. We wanted to find what happens when I shine a light straight down and I project that vector here. I want to know what is that vector, which I have in the past labeled as proje projection of v onto u. Right? You'll remember, hopefully, from chapter one that that is fairly easy to find. You just simply take um, v dotted with u over u dotted with u times the vector u. Okay? This is just a scalar, so you scale u down by this particular amount. Okay, well, we're going to do the same idea if, say, we've got a plane out here in space, and instead of having a normal vector to it, we've got some other vector like that, v. We want to project that straight down and find out what are the components of this projection onto a space, not w as a vector, sorry, but W as a space, okay? We want to find the projection of V onto a space, not just onto a vector, okay? All right, and the other thing that we're going to do that's new, and we haven't really talked about this, although we used it a little bit, is what is this vector right here? That is the vector that goes from here up to there. We used that when we were finding the distance from a point to a line, but I'm going to now give this a name. We're going to call that the perpendicular component of u, nope, sorry, of v onto u. So in this case, what you see is v, the original v, which is here, can be written as decomposed. into a part parallel to u and a part perpendicular to u. And we could do the same thing here, right? This would be the perp of u onto the space w. The nice thing about it, though, is if if you know v and you can find the projection of u, sorry, v onto u, then it, finding this one is as easy as subtracting v minus the projection, right? Since v would be equal to the projection of v onto u plus the perp of v onto u, then if we know this and we can. I had a video crash. So we know this, and since we know this and this, we can simply write perp of u, sorry, v onto the vector u is v minus the projection of v onto u. So we can find this, we can, well, we know this, it's given. We can find this knowing u, and then we can find that perpendicular component. We used this, in fact, the magnitude of this was the distance of a point to a line. But now, what about spaces, okay? That's the question we want to address, okay? Well, the good news is it's actually not that hard. If I can write it down in the space I have right down here. Let W be a subspace of Rn with orthogonal, and this is key, You've got to have an orthogonal basis 
we're going to call them V1, V2, out to VK. So you have to have a basis, but you also have to have an orthogonal basis for this to work. It doesn't have to be orthonormal, but orthonormal makes things a little bit nicer and neater. But if you have orthogonal, you've got it. Okay, that's key because we don't always have that. And that's what 5.3 is all about, is finding that when we know the space, but we don't have an orthogonal basis for it. All right, so given that we know that, then the orthogonal projection of V onto, of, I guess, any vector, out of Rn onto W is given by, okay? So V onto W, so finding this is a matter of using these. Turns out that the projection of V onto the space W is a linear combination of your basis, so you know it's gonna be something times V1 plus something times V2, plus dot, 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 plus something times VK. So you've gotta have coefficients here because this is the space, it's in the space W, it can be written as a linear combination of its basis. So the coefficients are, you take V dotted with V1 over V1 dotted with V1, V dotted with V2 over V2 dotted with V2 all the way down to your vector that you're projecting V dotted with VK over V dot VK VK okay so the beauty of this is to find the projection of V onto a subspace is you simply find the projections of V onto each element of the basis and take the sum, okay? So I'm not gonna write this down, but I have this written in my notes. I'm just gonna say it so you can hear it. V is decomposed into the sum of orthogonal projections of V onto mutually orthogonal one-dimensional subspaces of W. V1, V2, VK are mutually orthogonal. So if they are orthogonal to each other, then to find the projection of V onto W, you simply add up the orthogonal projections of V onto each one of those mutually orthogonal one-dimensional subspaces. Okay. And one last point to be made, it's unique. Theorem 5.11 says that V composed into W plus W per, I'm gonna adopt some notation he uses in the book here. I'm just calling this right here, actually I should probably write it out. Um, this right here is projection of V onto W and this right here is projection, or sorry, perp of V onto W the space. Okay, so if I write W as a vector and W perp as a vector, what I'm saying is this is V projected onto W, and this is V projected onto the orthogonal complement of W. Okay? Is unique. In other words, there's one and only one way to write V as a projection. When you project it straight down, there's going to be only one projection and one unique perpendicular component, okay? All right, so the last thing I need to do is an example. All right, so this is number 21 from the homework exercises. V equals four, negative two, three. And let's say W is the span of, and I'm going to give you orthogonal vectors, 1, 2, 1, and 1, negative 1, 1. Now you can check by either putting those in a matrix A, do A transpose A, you get a diagonal matrix, or you can just check dotted with each other, they're perpendicular, right? 
this started with this gives me zero. So these form an orthogonal basis for W, and W is a subspace of R3. Okay, so this would be a plane, right? Remember when you take two vectors, the subspace of R3 made up of spanning two vectors is a flat plane out in space. We're going to project this vector on here. So we want to know what's the projection and what's the perpendicular component. Well, since those are orthogonal, then the projection of V onto W is, remember, V dot with, I call that V1 and V2. here plus v dotted with v2 over v2 dotted with v2 times v2. And I can do this quickly, right? This dotted with this gives me 4 minus uh, 2, sorry, 4 minus 4 is 0 plus 3 over this dotted with itself, which is 1 plus 4 plus 1, which is 6 times v1 plus, and now this dotted with this is 4 plus 2 is 6, plus 3 is 9, and this dot with itself is 3, 1 plus 1 plus 1, right, you're squaring them, times V2. So that's um, 1 half times V1, which is 1, 2, 1, plus 3 times V2, which is 1, negative 1, 1. So 1 half plus 3 is 7 halves. Uh, 1 minus 3 is negative 2, and then 1 half plus 3 is another 7 halves. So that right there is what I would have called W. It's the projection of V onto W. Right? And now the perp of V onto the subspace W. This vector is going to be V minus W, V minus W, that is 4, negative 2, 3, minus 7 halves, negative 2, 7 halves. So 4 minus 7 halves, 4 is 8 halves, so that's 1 half. And negative 2 plus 2 is 0, and 3 minus 7 halves is negative 1 half. So there's W perp. Right? So V, in this case, is the sum of W plus W this vector added to this vector gives me the original V, but this is the vector that's in the plane, and this is the vector that goes from the end of the vector in the plane up to the actual vector. This is the projection and the perpendicular component. And that's all I want to have to say out of this lecture. I do want to point out, again, back to this point that I made right over here, where we're going next, is something called the Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization procedure, that if I gave you something like the span, if W was the span of 1, 2, 1, and 0, 0, 2, those two vectors are not orthogonal. So this still forms a subspace, but I can't apply this theorem, or this definition right here, to do projections onto that W. So what I want to do is I want to replace these two vectors with two vectors that are orthogonal to each other, but whose span is the same space as W.